it'll tell uh, sorry you. Sorry, everyone. While this is happening, sorry we've started a bit late. We've had lots of technical issues we've been resolving, so I apologise to let you in a, a little bit late. Okay, are we all systems go, Mod? We are. Okay, right, next. good evening, everybody. Welcome to um, the September Community Planning Alliance webinar. Um, and today we have got Nick Burton and Simon Thomas, who are both um, long standing members of our, our committee and the Community Planning Alliance. Uh, and Nick has spent or had spent around 40 years working in and around government, so he knows it uh, pretty well and pretty thoroughly. Uh, he's a key member of the Stop the Arc group, which managed to persuade government to stop the expressway and to withdraw 100 million houses. And he's now campaigning against the Arc by stealth, which you've probably all followed. Simon Thomas um, he has been in the advertising industry 45 years. Uh, he's a global senior manager. And he's had around 15 years campaigning locally down in Hampshire for the right homes in the right places at the right prices, which I'm sure we can all agree with. Uh, he's been, he was a local councillor for a decade and he's on the Hampshire CPRE planning group. So we're going to start this evening with Nick, who's going to talk about the workings of government and how um, to improve campaigners' ability to influence decisions at government. Then we're going to go on to uh, Simon, who will talk about the impact of national policy on local decisions and how you might be able to lobby and influence as a campaigner. Um, and we'll save questions to the end and we'll wrap up at six o'clock. So over to Nick and thank you very much. Thank you, Rosie. And I think you've had enough introduction of me. Um, this is talking a little bit about central government. There's some outline. I'm sure some of it were familiar to some of you. Hopefully not all of it to all of you. So we'll go from there. So, yes, Secretary of State is the title of it. Some insights into the workings of central government. Next slide, please, Marge. So we're going to cover departments, agency, who's in charge, the critical role of the Treasury, the Cabinet Office, parliamentary scrutiny and all party parliamentary groups and lobbying. Next, please. So these are departments that are perhaps of most concern to us. It's clearly not all of them. The Prime Minister doesn't actually have a department, which is a regular source of debate, but he has a very small private office and is mainly supported by various parts of the Cabinet Office. The Treasury will talk a little bit more in detail in a minute. Prime interest to us, the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities, which has gone through umpteen number name changes. That's its current one. DEFRA, Environment, farming and rural affairs and you can see immediately the conflicts of interest in that because what is good for the environment is not necessarily good for farming and is certainly not necessarily good for rural affairs transport business and trade gets renamed regularly when peter mandelson came back into the government for the third time under gordon brown he actually expanded the department to the, to the point that they had so many ministers they could have formed their own football team but since then, bits of it have been spun off again. So we have science and innovation and technology and in its latest guise, energy security and net zero. One of the key things to understand about these departments, not the Treasury, but the rest of them, is their key role as the trade union for their sector. They are the primary advocates for their sector within the rest of government. So DLUHC advocates on behalf of the house builders and on behalf of people who want to build houses and on behalf to a lesser extent of people who want houses. DEFRA advocates on behalf of farmers. The Department of Transport advocates on behalf of the rail industry and the road builders and transport in general and so on. So there's this critical part that as far as the centre of government is, is concerned, if you if you like, the sort of prime minister and the treasury and the cabinet office bit, there are all these people permanently knocking on their doors saying, please spend some more money on me because this is what my bit of the world can actually do for you. And that's a continuing argument, but a very much, you know, the, the way the people are describing is going native. If you go to transport, you suddenly love rail and so on. Next, please. So, one of the things that has gone through the Fashington government is this idea of having agencies rather than actually everybody's in the government because the majority of the civil service spend their time delivering things they don't set policy which is what they all thought they joined to do originally and one of the ways that that was done to make that split slightly more explicit was to establish various agencies they have different titles and they go through evolution to titles but the principle is the same and that's people like the planning inspectorate and national highways 
and network rail sorry we've lost a bullet homes england some of them are more specifically part of the government but at arm's length what are known as non-departmental public bodies and the most significant examples of those are the regulators so people like the environment agency who you're well aware will be complaining about sewage spillage and so on the financial conduct authority and the charity commission and so on so very much part that they are part of government they actually tell people when they're doing things wrong or how to do things right but they do not have a minister in charge who is not directly responsible for them so that it, the theory is that the minister does not have a direct involvement and therefore politics is not part of their decision it's not as i'm sure you're aware a perfect system other organizations that come into this category are people like museums science museum british museum and so on and there are quite a lot of others we won't go into all the details today next please so who's in charge of all of this all departments are run by a member of the cabinet who's usually titled the secretary of state and he is the senior minister and he's in charge ultimately of the entire department and he carries the can for the entire department he will have one or more junior ministers the next grade down is called a minister of state the grade below that is called a parliamentary under secretary and if you want an example uh, so the next grade beyond that is an unpaid parliamentary private secretary and their key role is to link to the parliamentary party so the secretary of state doesn't have time for wandering around the houses of commons listening to the gossip in the tea room and what mps of all parties have to say of, on a particular subject the parliamentary private secretary's job is to fill that link for him it's not a trivial job two of margaret thatcher's pps's were murdered by the ira because they recognized the influence that job has if you want an indication of how the succession works claire cortino who's just become the new secretary of state uh, in um, for energy was a pps she was a two stints of being a pus she skipped to being a minister of state and she finally finished up as the secretary of state in three years that's a very rapid round advance uh, and not necessarily how things normally work the permanent secretary is the senior civil servant in the department, the Sir Humphrey of uh, umpteen comedy series. They all meet on Wednesday mornings and you will actually see letters addressed to dear Wednesday morning colleagues, because one of the key things about your status in, in this uh, hierarchy is whether you get invited to such meetings. And there are a bunch of people who do and a bunch of people who don't. There are the other critical role is they are the accounting officer. They are ultimately responsible for the financial well-being and particularly accuracy of the finances of that department. And that role extends in all sorts of other places across government, but it is a critical one for the central government departments. And again, the Treasury issues advice to accounting officers and you get letters addressed to dear accounting officer. The next group of people who don't fit into either of the above, above categories are what are called special advisors. Civil servants are not supposed to provide political advice. However, that it's not a sort of black and white statement. They never get involved in politics. There's quite a sensible quote, I think, of civil servants need to be politically aware, not politically aligned. So if you're putting things up to the minister, you need to be aware what the politics of it might be not necessarily on providing the advice on the best way to handle them. And SPADs, because they are comparatively new in post, they're comparatively junior people, but they are also important people and because of that influence. Um, and the quote I'll give you from Sir Richard Mottram, who was the permanent secretary uh, in the Department of Transport, when one of the special advisors issued an infamous statement that the days of um, the 9-11 attack on the New York World Trade Center were a good day to issue bad news because it wouldn't make the headlines. And when that and a subsequent um, event all came out, Sir Richard Mottram was quoted from a private conversation of, we're all fucked, I'm fucked, you're fucked, the whole department is fucked, it's the biggest cock up ever, we're all completely fucked. Um, and th there is a degree of um, overstatement in that clearly but it's an indication of just when those spad relationships go wrong how dangerous they could be 
Equally, if you can get influence in there, it's a very key way of getting it at the minister. Uh, somebody said, has our special tanks, special, our think tanks classed as special advisors? The answer is no, because a special advisor is a government appointment and there are limits on how many you can have and so on. But a lot of people tend to oscillate between think tanks and special advisors. And obviously, depending on the politics of the think tank and the politics of the government, that influence who gets uh, invited. Um, a next key group who are slightly separate from the rest of the civil service are, the, are what are called the chief scientific advisors. You'll all be familiar that the government has one after seeing him on umpteen COVID um, broadcasts, but each of the department has a special advisor as well. And their job in theory is to provide that independent special advice. And therefore they are a useful target because you can find out who they are and their email address if you have a particularly logical argument to make because they are more likely to listen to it. However, it needs to be a good argument and you need to catch their attention. It's not automatic. A key thing to be aware of is that the list of ministerial responsibilities is published. It's updated three or four times a year. The last one that I can find is the 20th of July, which means it will still have Ben Wallace in it as the Defence Secretary. But that gives you the breakdown because junior ministers share the responsibilities and it's often interesting to see who holds what. So you heard my the references earlier to the Oxford Cambridge Arc. The ministerial responsibility for that has oscillated between the Department of Leveling Up and the Treasury and even within different ministers in the Treasury. And it currently sits with John Glenn, who is the Chief Secretary, which is actually the, mo the highest it's ever been and probably indicates the amount of money they want to spend on East West Rail. Next, please. The Treasury. The Treasury is the only department with two cabinet members, the, both the Chancellor and the Chief Secretary. The Chief Secretary's responsibility is to control expenditure. He doesn't worry about where it's coming from, what taxes and so on. His job is to minimise the amount that goes out the front door. And there are various mem means of doing that. Marge, did you see there was a message about cut off in audio? OK, I'm hoping that's come back then. So that uh, there are various mechanisms for dealing with that. Including uh, we can, I can hear you, Nick. OK, I think um, yeah, okay. everybody else should be able to hear you. Yeah, okay, yes, so thank can you. I, Nick. Yep. OK, if we can go back to the slides, thank you. Yes, so that's the Star Chamber is one of the mechanisms for dealing with that. All departmental expenditure is actually on sufferance. It is a direct delegation from the Treasury. It literally is their money, which is why they get so uptight about it. The Treasury is a very small department. It only has 2,000 staff out of 488,000 civil servants of one sort or another. So, and the bit that looks at government spending, which is the bit that we're mainly interested in, is only covers three of 26 directors, and they have one deputy director of 106 who looks at the whole of the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities. So you can see the number of people looking at individual part, departments is probably in the sort of 10 or 15 numbers. They cannot possibly be expert on everything. They cannot possibly have the time to look at everything. So this is partly why you get some slightly sweeping statements made and the government does, the Treasury does tend to when work on the back of postage, uh, back of envelope stuff about decisions, for instance, around how much money you spend mending schools that have got concrete problems. Um, just also be aware that there is a split between revenue and capital expenditure, and we're generally interested in the capital bit, so uh, you want to avoid getting excited about revenue. The culture I describe it was very much mother handing out coppers to the children, because it is literally on delegation. Um, there are even such phrases as you are not allowed to indulge in novel and contentious expenditure without specific Treasury approval. And if the Treasury think that you are doing something you shouldn't, they will, as they've recently did with the LUHC, withdraw any approval for capital expenditure. So every penny they spend on all the new towns fund and the regeneration fund for this and all those other things that we keep hearing about, all of that currently has got to go back to the Treasury, to this small group of 10 people who are actually trying to measure it. Another effect of the Treasury's oversight is annularity. The books have to balance on the 31st of March each year. But of course, 
as anybody who's tried to run a budget, you can't balance the books exactly. So what happens is what I've described, it's not their phase, is the January crisis. So in January, the finance director in every department will send round a message along the lines of, we are about to underspend this year because we underspend most years. Anybody who's got a project that they can spend and commit to spending the money by the end of March, it's the commitment, you don't actually have to spend it, will therefore be favourably reviewed and is likely to get it through. So people who've been around a while, therefore, have that list of projects in their back pocket in the autumn, knowing that they're going to get asked for it in January. The spending reviews are an attempt to try and get out of that annularity to at least give departments up to a three year view of their expenditure, but they still get tweaked and reviewed and hauled over on an annual basis. And the last thing I was going to mention is hypothecation, wonderful phrase, which is allocating the income from a specific tax to expenditure on a specific project. And the Treasury hates that because their job is to balance the books and the way they balance the books is the fact that we've spent too much money on employment allowance because the unemployment rates have gone up therefore we need to recover it by not spending money on mending schools or whatever so any any tax that i hypothecated prevents them from doing that and therefore they think it is a bad thing next please cabinet office the Cabinet Office has the job of coordinating across all these um, herding cats because each of the departments, as I said, effectively acts as an advocate for its own sector. And it used to be fairly ineffectual at doing so in many cases. It has become more effective as effectively it's been given more power because it doesn't own the money and because the Treasury does, that limits its authority, but it has become more effective. And one of the recent examples of that is actually taking over the procurement of COVID items. Whether it was better than not, it was certainly not something that the NHS people could deal with in the volume that was acquired. It also used to be seen, and I think this is still true, as a temporary home for the talented from out of step. So the bright, often quite young senior civil servant who come up with this brilliant paper on a, on a new policy for the government that just happened to be what the minister decided precisely what he didn't want to do would be an ideal candidate for him to go off to the cabinet office where his talents would be used in whatever problem they had this week but was then available to come back to the department because a lot of most of the cabinet office people were on secondment um, once the minister had calmed down over the um, the argument and in all very likelihood it moved on to a new job possibly even another department so the cabinet, there are other bits of the cabinet office that are more significant, but they're not really relevant to us, which are around intelligence coordination and security and some things like that. Uh, next, please. So how do we scrutinize, how is the parliament scrutinized this and what, for what can we do to get involved with it? Um, the, mo the key committee is actually the public accounts committee, which coming back to my comments about the role of the treasury, as the Treasury controls all the money, the PAC looks at all the money and therefore it will stick its hand and nose into anything it thinks of interest. Specifically, it sponsors the National Audit Office, who are the, as the name suggests, the people responsible for auditing government expenditure and who do write some fairly hard hitting reports about when things go wrong. And hopefully, as again they did on the concrete stuff, before they go wrong, but the government then has to catch up and do something about it. The NAO specifically works for the PAC, and if you look at the PAC website, you will find a host of letters. They write more letters than any other committee and investigations they're dealing with, a lot of which will be relevant to what you want to know, but often are very good indicators and very good source of information. Each department then also has a select committee that looks at it, including one for the Treasury, who looks at the rest of what the Treasury does rather than the expenditure side. Um, and those select committees have become more powerful, particularly since the chairman were elected. They normally have 13 members balanced across the parliament competition um, as most recent election. They write reports into things that they're interested in. They're often quite long winded. They will take both written evidence, which can be anybody, any of us can write in and put a written evidence in if we wish to. And also oral evidence, typically from the department itself, but also academic and um other experts in that area 
they review appointments of key people, typically chief executives of things rather than every director general in the, appointment, in the department or something like that. And on their behalf, the chairman will write letters on things of significance, but not necessarily of current interest. All of those, again, are available in public, they're on their website, and they are a very useful indication as to what the flow of thing is and what the sort of thing is that will catch their attention. The committees have both uh, Twitter handles and um, email addresses as a committee, but you can also write to individual MPs. If you do, you need to make sure that you say you are writing them as a member of that committee, otherwise you will just get pushed off by the usual approach of um, you're not in my constituency. The, it is quite possible to lobby committees, and we've done quite a successful campaign, for instance, to stop the art to actually get a question asked in a committee by one particular member uh, on a specific subject. They are approachable. If you see a thing that says we're writing a report and the deadline for um, written evidence was three weeks ago, and you want to put something in, ring them up and ask, because the answer is almost invariably, they're still writing the report, and they will at least look at what you sent. They may not take any notice of it, but you can do things like that. You're also welcome to attend them, either in person, or they are invariably, all the um, committee meetings are broadcast online. If you attend them, you are not allowed to ask questions or make comments or generally interfere, but you can certainly grab MPs before or after the meeting, uh, and ask them questions and if you know who you're talking to then you can build up a relationship that way. Parliamentary questions, obviously the formal bit, I'm not talking about PMQs but the more regular ones. Um, there is roughly a six weekly departmental cycle so each department comes around about every six weeks which is about 10 questions. Urgent questions are clearly the ones that are the headlines, again probably less of interest to us. Routine ones you go on a list so that we can then, um, you know, you have a pecking order. If you're on the top one, your question will get asked. If you're at the bottom, you won't. Uh, and depending how busy it is, it's in between. And but most questions will then go to a written response uh, where the minister is, has to reply to them. You do come across thing called what I call planted questions, which is a way of making a ministerial announcement without calling it announcement. So he will get one of his mates who's an MP to ask him a question to which the answer is, I wish to announce we're going to build so and so, not do so and so, change the policy. And so. Last uh, thing in this, big, MP's letters. MP's letters are useful because a minister has to reply to an MP. Now you may get the same bullshit that he said in public, but often there is more detail. There is um, both in the question and in the response that can be very useful, but it's that obligation to apply that is critical, which um, you don't get as a member of the public. Next one, please. And we're nearly finished. All party parliamentary groups, all party parliamentary groups are cross party groups, both MPs and peers covering subjects of interest. There are 755 as of the last list I saw, including one for each of uh, nearly every country in the world. Um, they, some of them have meetings, some of them have virtually no meetings, some they are usually held in public um, and they do sometimes do other events. A critical thing to look at is who the secretariat is. So those are the four that are currently around housing and planning. The housing and planning one is the secretariat is the World Town Planning Institute, reasonably respected body. Housing and so social mobility is communities that work which advocates for social mobility. Housing in the north, funnily enough, is a bunch of people who build houses in the north. And the housing market and housing delivery group is a professional lobby organisation called College Green and is heavily influenced by the National House Building Federation, amongst others. So you can see, but again, one of the useful things of this, I want to go an advocate for something, I want an MP who's interested look at what APPGs are relevant to you and who the members are, because that will tell you who is interested, both say MPs and members of the House of Lords. Finally, lobbying very briefly, there are now growing restrictions on uh, lobbying. I think APPGs will have more restrictions in the future because there's some very dodgy things that have come out in the last few years. There is a register of lobbyists, but there are currently quite a lot of ways of getting around. It. Anyway, I hope that's given you some insight and apologies for the gallop through. And I'll now hand over to Simon. Thank you very much, Nick. I'm just going to load if I can get there.
make sure I get to the right place. Sorry, I've just put up this, the the uh, the wrong I, one. I can't see your screen, um, uh, Simon. No, hang on. Here we go again. Try again. Uh, window. My problem is I have so many. Here we go. Let's try that one. So is has that now come up? Ah, it has now. Yes, you just need to put it on present mode. So of course I do. I'm I'm almost there, Marge. You're almost there. Perfect. Does that, Thank does you. Does that work for you? Yeah, it does. Right. Well, perfect. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Simon Thomas. I'm going to try and link back to what Nick has just talked about uh, from the world of Sir Humphrey uh, through to local government, which is where I think many of us probably have our most of our activity. What I'm going to do is just talk about local government and how it's constructed and then talk about the key things. So that's what, who and how and, and also add to that when we do things with a very quick summary and then we'll move into the Q&A session after that. So local government um, in the news at the moment, um, Birmingham going bankrupt following Woking, Thurrock, and I'm sure there will be many other local government councils to follow. Um, one of the biggest issues has been the reduction in in grants and central funding through the annual financial settlement to local government. They are struggling. Um, but the way it's constructed is that there are some regional authorities, big ones such as Greater London Authority. Then we've got London boroughs. We have unitary councils, um, Cornwall, Wiltshire, various ones where you will be, some metropolitan boroughs, and then the main 24 county councils, which is often where we get involved um, as, as CPA with particularly countryside and semi-rural environments. 181 district councils, and those are what are called two-tier councils. And then there are 10,000 parish and town councils. So it's an incredibly complicated structure. It will vary enormously by where you live. And also the, the competence of both the officers who are the employees of those councils and the councillors will vary. I have been a councillor. My wife has been a councillor. We've worked with a two different administrations. Um, 15 years ago, they were extremely competent. Now they are totally useless uh, and they couldn't organise the proverbial in a brewery. Uh, it does vary and it varies enormously. And and unfortunately, this this will come out at the end in that we have to be very careful and very flexible in, in how we deal with local government. So just to reiterate, you know, the national policies are the Local Government Act and the Localism Act, which was meant to return power to the more power to the community. Um, it depends on what you define as a community. Normally, the lowest level will be a district council or a borough. Um, however, with the neighbourhood planning promotion, uh, wonderful, and it sounded fantastic at the time, but I think some of you have heard me speak on this before, neighbourhood plans just in most cases have not worked and have actually been a bit of a three car trick. Um, and the whole prospect of devolution and devoluting basically expensive time consuming tasks back down to district or even to parish and town councils seems to be a way of the government offloading some of their national responsibilities. The classic and the massive cost shift that's taken place in the last decade is in terms of adult and children's social care going from central government to local government. There is, of course, then the three big ones for us within CPA, the Town and Country Planning Act, and 72, I think, but somebody may correct me, the MPPF, a latest version just been published. Don't get excited. It does not get rid of ele paragraph 11D and the five year land supply. It does not get rid of the standard calculation. It merely uh, relaxes the conditions on onshore wind farms. And then there is PPG, the planning policy guidelines, which are basically the rules by which planning inspectors 
operate and and hopefully consistency uh, consistently but not always uh, make their decisions at, at a local level you have your local plan which is a statutory obligation of the local planning authority that may be a district or a borough council or in a unitary it will be the county council or in the case of somewhere like the duchy of cornwall they've dropped the word council it's just cornwall council um, lots of issues have no time not, not a lot of time to go into those today but i think through all of this we will find it's the effectiveness of both the elected representation and the ability and competence and actually resources available to the employed officers. There are then things called supplementary planning documents, which some councils use extremely effectively, or we as campaigning organisations can ask them to add to their local plan. Uh, again, at the moment, enormous disruption and problems in terms of local plans, some being approved and, and putting to uh, sorry being put to examination and approved some being put on freeze some being withdrawn uh, and some being restarted going through the whole process through the issues and concerns and then regulation 18 etc etc um, and a local plan can take three to five years to do and will cost millions of pounds uh, this is something a lot of local taxpayers do not understand uh, they are very expensive and then finally a neighborhood plan um, from about 2015-16 more and more neighborhood plans started coming online some of them are now getting very old uh, but they still have policy adopted policy uh, powers uh, particularly where the local plan has not changed to make that neighborhood plan out of step and the latest thing um, the government introduced uh, with our friends um, with mr mr gove the secretary of state and his colleagues at DLUC, are the design guidelines the local design guidelines as well as the national ones um, my personal and my cynical view is that they've done these to divert people away from the, the higher level policies and principles and a lot of the things their government wishes to introduce as national planning policies so they would no longer be part of the local plan decision making um, or policy setting process and we have lerb the leveling up bill uh, on its way going through the lords and the and, and the commons uh, there are lots of amendments there have been lots and lots of public statements in the media uh, on on politics today uh, even statements made in the house and i'm sure as we approach the election there will be even more and more of them very few of those statements have actually transferred into actual legislation or actual changes to the way policy is implemented in the real world so remember that these are statutory responsibilities of the local planning authority and a lot of people may forget this when they say to their their district council or their county council or even their mp you know why don't you oppose that that's wrong that's wrong well when you are a councillor you have a councillor's code of conduct and you have to go by the law yes we can try and change policy but we actually have to implement the policy that's in place until we can get it changed and that nick referred to lobbying for example um, that's very much something that needs to be done at a national primary and national level initially so i know we're going to be short of time so so i'll, I'll plow on ahead at a bit of a rate um, I'm going to talk about local plans and then I'm going to talk about applications and appeals because there are two different sets of people. There's a lot of commonality, but there are differences. So I'm looking at a, a quadrant here where we've got national at the top and local at the bottom. We've got policy on the left hand side, decisions in the middle and consultation on the right hand side. These are just an example. They will vary by your local county, your local county or unitary or your district or borough local planning authority. So please don't take these as a, as a template. It's merely illustrative at this stage. That lovely word that developers love to use, illustrative plans. So first of all, up in the top left, we have the Department of Leveling Up and Communities. They set the national policy. They also don't tend to listen very much or they will give you evasive answers. Nick's dealt with some of that already. We then have our local planning authority. We have the cabinet. 
eight or 10 people, perhaps holding the portfolios under a leader in an executive and cabinet style government introduced by the Blair government many years ago, not run necessarily by committees. So that they are a they are a, a decision making body. I have quite a lot of knowledge of that because my wife was a cabinet member for three years. We have also the, the, in terms of policy, the Development Policy Committee or something similarly named within the council. That may just be a rubber stamping committee or it may actually have some teeth. It will depend on one that the council is involved and the political uh, makeup of that particular committee and also how that particular council is operating and what their challenges are in, in, in terms of planning. And then thirdly, there are the employed officers. Uh, in most cases in planning departments, they will be fully qualified graduate planners. They will be members of the Royal Town Planning Institute. Uh, they have a CV and a resume to worry about. They don't want a failed local plan. They won't, don't want to get known as a constant refuser and so on and so forth. But also they must maintain their professional standards. Now that becomes quite a debate because in my experience, the best LPA officers very quickly move over to either planning consultancies or to act directly into developers um, like Barrett's or, or, or Persimmon, Bellway, etc. Um, and unfortunately, the poorly paid officers, and they are poorly paid, uh, around national, national average incomes in some cases at a junior level, they will remain with the council and often they are understaffed and they are overworked. There's also, you, there may be a neighbourhood plan. That will have been produced by the parish or town council or a combination of parish or town councils for a designated area. And that is adopted policy. So that, that actually has weight and uh, it does have benefits, although it's an enormous amount of work to actually one, set up a neighbourhood plan and two, to review and keep it up to date. Moving across more to the consultation side, um, I'm perhaps a little bit uh, jaundiced in this in that you have ward councillors. Um, we had for 10 years a very good ward councillor. That ward councillor stood down, at the last, didn't stand for re-election in May. And we have a new ward councillor who's what's called a paper candidate. They only stood as a paper candidate and they actually got elected. They are not interested. They know nothing about planning and they do not respond to emails, they don't respond to telephone calls, they only turn up for the monthly uh, council meeting. That's it. If you have one of those, you have a problem and you need, find, you need to find ways of circumventing. In other cases, and congratulations to two members of the CPA in Sussex who were elected as independent councillors. We've got people who are non-political councillors who understand planning and are actually rolled their sleeves up and are getting involved. So well done to them. There's also the parish council or town council. Um, they may be completely ineffective or they may actually be very good at actually working with their, their ward councillors, with the officers and even with the cabinet at your local planning authority. Incredible variation. Um, however, my experience is that in most cases, the parish councils find it very difficult because they have no decision making powers. They are only a statutory consultee. The county council, the county cabinet and the, ca and the county councillors themselves involved primarily in highways and education and particularly in S106 contributions. Um, not time to go into all of that today, but basically, again, unless they are engaged and working with your local planning authority, often the developer contributions can fall well short of what is required. And secondly, are often well behind the curve in being implemented. So after the, after the development has happened, then they will think about expanding the school or actually improving the road system. There are some cases, um, and many of you will know these, where some of that infrastructure has to be put in first, but in my experience, they are the exception rather than the rule. We now move to the interesting group of people, landowners. Many, many people think it's the district or county councils that, that bring the sites forward. It is not. It's 
landowners with developers and particularly land and development promoters like Gladman, um, recently bought by Barrett's, who put them forward through the law, the law process, the land availability assessment process. And the council, as the statutory body, as the local planning authority, has to work through that, doing the initial filter of deliverability and suitability, all the way through to the process of when an application is made or when an allocation is made in the local plan. The MP should be involved in local plan. Many MPs will slope their shoulders and say, oh, it's planning, that's decision making for the local authority. Yes, it is for applications, but where you have a major issue such as mitigation against your standard calculation uh, housing target or your affordability index that's being applied or the presence of a national park, um, particularly big for us in Hampshire with both the South Downs National Park and the New Forest, where enormous tracts of land are not able to be developed on it puts more pressure on other areas so your mp really should be involved some get involved and some have get very heavily involved um, we have through cpa a number of mps who we have spoken to at length in the past and who have in intervened but yet there are others perhaps looking for their ministerial careers who stay well out of it lobbying groups and quangos over on the policy side Again, I'm not going to spend time. Nick's covered some of this. They will put advice through. They also will appear across on the consultation side. But down in the bottom left corner, very local, is campaign groups and residents. There are also quangos and lobbying groups, CPA, CPRE, just being two examples uh, on the consultation level. So you can see from all of this, there are an enormous number of people. And this is just a local plan. And of course, who actually makes the final decision on the local plan? It's an examining inspector, one person. So consultation and questioning policy is absolutely crucial. Very quickly going through the same process for an application. The decisions are made by the local planning authority with county looking at the highways and education aspects. Lots of consultation or perhaps lobbying by the landowners, developers and promoters. The ward councillors hopefully getting involved. They don't always. Your neighbourhood plan steering group and your campaign groups and residents with their comments and parish councils as well. And here I would say, don't just stick to the, you know, what, the norm when you're asked to do something. Be preemptive, be proactive before the event. And I'll come back to that very shortly. And uh, Marge, I'm very aware of how time is ticking away and we've got 15 minutes left. Um, there's also the Quangos and lobbying groups still and CPA. We can't actively get directly involved in every campaign across the country, not with 600 plus of them, but we will help with, you know, with, with, with general advice or putting people in contact with each other. Your MP, unlikely unless there is political gain for them to be got out of it so it may be something to do with drainage for example and sewage and that particular mp thinks that it will aid their re-election but mps generally will not get involved with individual applications and when it's an appeal it's a planning inspector a single planning inspector after either written submissions, a hearing which is a round table or inquiry which is a quasi legal um, process with barristers normally present, uh, they will make that decision. And it may well be after the LPA you know, has made a very sound refusal on a balanced decision or in case where there's no five year land supply using what's termed the tilted balance, where the where the benefits are up weighted and the impacts are down weighted, that inspector may well decide to actually say I uphold the appeal and permission is granted. One person. There's something wrong with the system in that. So when? Well, timing is everything and timing will be different for you, depending on your specific cases, whether it be a local plan or whether it be an application or indeed whether it be an appeal. But the key thing is get ahead of the curve. The biggest single problem um, that has happened in my experience over the last 15, almost 20 years now um, of, of fighting applications is the first that most residents know about it is when the bulldozers go into the field to start doing the groundwork. 
Um, I've actually got somebody I was talking to in the pub at the weekend who moved into quite a quiet village two and a half years ago. Uh, they are now going to get 500 houses on their doorstep. They thought they were moving into a quiet village environment. And I said to them, well, didn't you check out the planning authority's website? Because there, that site was allocated 10 years ago and has been in every local plan since. They just they hadn't done their research. And it's the same for all of us, whether we be residents or campaign groups. We need to know more about it. We need to get an intelligence network so we know what applications are coming up, what the developers are doing. And we need to be talking to the planning officers to establish relationships with them, not just a conf confrontation with them when the application comes in. Anticipate the different scenarios. If there is a housing target of 10,000 dwellings over the 15 years of the local plan, they have got to go somewhere. So it and you will then find ward councillors or uh, the you know, or the cabinet will start fighting their own corners and the cabinet member may decide in their their particular ward they don't want any allocations. So it gets dumped on the ward of the count of the most junior councillors who don't put up any arguments. So all of this scenario planning and you have to anticipate what's going to happen, but also set the priorities. What are the priorities and what are, what are the priorities for the community? You may have to take some dwellings. Well, if you do, make sure you get more than the S106 and SIL developer contributions. Get some real planning gain. And remember, you know, where we're talking of sites of 100 houses plus, we're talking of millions of pounds going to landowners and going into profit. The fact that a number of the developers have been so greedy that they've actually overextended themselves in terms of their borrowing with interest rates going up, et cetera, we're seeing them now whinging and moaning. But quite frankly, the profits they've had in the last 10 years have been outrageous. And make sure what you do is effective. Demonstrations let off steam. A professional conversation with a planning officer who's either looking after an application or a member of the development policy officers team to talk about the principles and the way in which they're going to apply the spatial strategy adopted, which may be they want to have a garden village or maybe they have for large sites of maybe 500 houses or they just allocate small sites out across all of the all of the settlements uh, based on their size across the towns villages and hamlets in the district that's a conversation they have internally we should be part of that conversation but we need to make it effective so that we then get impacts on decision making because that's the key and it's the same in what we're doing here with any you know with any business environment or in any any family environment you know what what is going to be the impact of this and what are the outcomes going to be because by the time you start experiencing the outcomes it's far too late to do anything about it so the watchword here is you need to be incredibly adaptable and flexible and what might have been the case five years ago may well have changed and you need to be aware of that and you need to do your homework and you need to establish those relationships with local council officers, with your your council, individual elected councillors and with senior councillors such as the leader, um, which in, in our particular case has been incredibly useful in that we established a relationship a few years ago and that has now continued. And it's a professional business like relationship with him. And how it. Well, you collect information, you acquire knowledge and skills. You also collect people because without people, this doesn't happen. And I think every single campaign group I know of, and certainly we in the CPA, certainly in CPRE, um, we are suffering from lack of people. There's not enough people. We need to get more people involved, but we also need to understand the law and the policies, and we need to understand the MPPF. Uh, and we need to try to understand where Mr Gove is going with future policy. I know that's very difficult and uh, I'd love to have a, 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 a forecast and a crystal ball to see where it's going. But I don't, I don't think anyone knows. To be honest with you, I don't even think Mr Gove knows. And we need to understand the stakeholders objectives. 
that includes the landowner, that includes the developer and their consultants. We need to actually meet them part of the way and understand what they're trying to do. And but by doing a professional approach, that actually gets a lot more traction and a lot more positive outcomes than purely confronting. And we need to continually analyze what's going on and collect insight and share between each other. And all the time using the material policies that, are, that exist. What is material planning? I know a lot of residents get very emotional and get very upset. That is, of course, a pressure valve, you know, and releasing that pressure is important. But if we're going to get actually any results, we need to have that factual accuracy. And we need to offer, whether it be for the local plan, the development officers, or for each application, those who are making the decision, whether that be a delegated decision or whether that be a committee decision of councillors, solutions, not just objections. If you if you offer somebody a solution as well, then apps, then you tend to find they will move to your way. So my watchword is communicate and compromise. Don't confront and conflict. And remember, this is not a map. This is a marathon. It's not a quick sprint. It takes time. It takes a long time. Um, Two, two allocated sites in our L LPA were first allocated in a pl local plan in 1995. One was built out in 2008 to 2011. The second one did not get built out until 2014 to 2018. As you can imagine, the local residents neighbouring the, the second site had no idea it had been allocated in 1995. So in summary, Every LPA, every local planning authority is different. Every local plan's different. Every application is different. So I've stuck a Rubik's Cube up in the corner there because it often feels that's what we're doing, trying to solve a Rubik's Cube. Remember also councillors can change every four years. If they don't, often they will tend to be the better councillors, to be honest with you, uh, because a lot of people that stand either as, either as district stroke borough or town stroke parish councillors They've had enough after four years. They can't cope. And remember also, in many cases, it's the officers who actually run things. Um, many a time I've had experience both through my wife as a district councillor and a cabinet member and myself as a parish councillor. If your officers don't want to do something. It takes a long time to get them to do it, or in some cases they never do it. They just prevaricate and delay. There are, we know, far too many tiers of local government, often siloed departments. There's a lot of self-interest and some of that is conflicting. And where it is pecuniary in its conflict, then that needs calling out. But I get a bit fed up of hearing the constant call of, oh, well, it's all about brown envelopes. I can tell you in 10 years of being a councillor, I, was, I wasn't offered one once. And the decision making often appears slow and confusing. And it does happen behind closed doors. Often the council meeting where the where the motion is put forward is literally rubber stamping. And there's been weeks and weeks of discussion between individuals to get the votes together. I mean, but again, that's how a lot of businesses operate. Also, many people think consultations as technical exercises is just lip service. I think that's right. Um, I think what the government are trying to do with more consultation and more availability of information is good, but what is bad is they're shortening the time periods if that gets put through in, in DLUC uh, and the MPF, MPPF changes. And we know the planning system is broken, but we've got to work inside it. It is the law. Until it changes and we can make change and have made change a little bit through our, our lobbying and work, but until it's changed, you, you have to stick with what you've got if you want to try and change, make decisions and influence those decisions. So identify the influencers and decision makers. And as I said before, communicate and compromise. Don't confront and conflict. Nick and I can take a few questions with a few minutes left. Just to say there's some useful links there. And of course, I wanted to put that up because this will be recorded and go up on the website. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Simon, for that. Um, so we literally have a couple of minutes left. So quick answers, please. We've tried to answer some in the chat. Um, 
is there a quick answer to um i lost it there's one about the self build yeah is there a remedy for an authority that fails under the housing and planning act 2016 to service plots which meet the demand for self or custom building on the statutory registers so um is there a quick answer to that simon is there a legal recourse wow uh i think unfortunately rosie we're going down and, and we need to speak to the cat about this. You'd be going back down a judicial review. Yeah, I, th I think that's the only I'm way. Afraid. Isn't it? Yeah, that's the only way I can think. Um, unless okay. unless you get unless you can get members, councillors who are involved at se and senior councillors to look at it with the officers. Yes. Can you, I don't know, Nick, what do you think? Um, the local government om ombudsman. Or they not doesn't take do, planning. Doesn't do planning. Um, yeah. So but that's, no. but that's failing to meet a statutory obligation, which might they might just pick up. Yeah. Worth yeah and it, it's also something asking the MP, you know, and as Nick said, yeah. it's a statutory requirement, Mr. Member of Parliament. That is your job. Exactly. And then they can't say it's planning. We don't deal with it. You say yeah. it's law. So, um, yeah. And, and for the next and for the next 12 months, remember, all of them will be cats on a hot tin roof. Exactly. Yeah. Super responsive at the yeah. moment, aren't they? Um, OK. Does the local planning authority need to hold a consultation on the area of a neighbourhood plan if it is simply just the parish boundary? I think that's another um, Simon one. Uh, no, well, it doesn't have to because it's set by the local planning authority in liaison with the parish council if the designate the proposed designated area is the parish council boundary however most lpas would just put that out to a consultation for confirmation okay thanks. because there may be very good reasons why it shouldn't it might not include some of the parish or should include parts outside the parish boundary yeah and it will have to be justified went to inspector so that that's the problem is you would end up you could end up getting to the examination stage and the inspector saying well why didn't you hold a consultation to confirm that yeah so best to cover bases maybe um this one i like i think it's my favorite question today um do you think turbocharged clerks can be effective in overhauling parish councils like the thought of the turbocharged <laughs> clerk <laughs> 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 um wow well uh, i mean it depends what the issues are um sort you know sorting out what sorting yeah. out decision making sorting out finances sorting out something an individual is not happy with um it, it really does depend i mean i've had an experience of what were somebody who was an excellent parish clerk um i've also had an experience of somebody who was quite dreadful uh, however, I think often the parish council gets the clerk it deserves um, if they pay them properly and depending on what their precept and or budget is, you know, uh, it can be quite a significant job. And the duties of a clerk and the financial duties upon a clerk now and some parish councils and town councils will split the jobs of the, of the clerk and the responsible finance officer, which I think is a very sensible thing to do. So let the clerk deal with procedure and process um yeah that can be but i'm not sure what a turbocharged clerk is to be honest with you um no. you know um, are they qualified and how well qualified are they because they're uh, different rosie, the, yeah go on rosie the more useful thing i think might be worth thinking about is the experience of places like foam where it's actually a town council not a parish council um but fundamentally the same statutory body who actually said we want to go run things we're not interested in party politics we are going to actually set up something that runs our town better and we are going to take functions off the local district authority that they don't have either the resources or the inclination to deal with uh, i think the book is called something like flat pack democracy yeah, and yeah. Oh, yes. that i think is a very useful model of actually how to make local government work better at the so it's it's to be honest, it is towns. It's a lot more difficult to do in a rural area because the resources yeah. just aren't there. But I yeah. think that is a is a, a useful thing to be aware of and to follow. I, no, I, I in 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 contrast to that, I would 
uh, I'm not going to name it, but I know one district council and I know one town council where there was a change of councillors. For the first two years, it was wonderful. And in both cases, they were what's called independent resident councillors. They took away the political side of it. And after two years, half of them left. Um, the clerk decided to jack it in. And now they are in a terrible, terrible mess, both the district and the town council. So, you know, yeah. be careful what you wish for. Uh, <laughs> Always be careful what you wish for. Now, I'm really sorry. There are a couple of questions we haven't had a chance to get to, but um, we are past six o'clock. Um, so uh, firstly, this will be on our YouTube channel tomorrow. It's the Community Planning Alliance, if you search for it. Sorry, uh, in the next few days. Um, and thank you very much to Nick and to Simon. That was a really good overview. Um, it's nice to feel properly armed and to understand the system so you can operate properly within them. Um, and I like the thought of going to a scientific advisor because they actually are interested in facts and evidence, unlike lots of people we deal with in, in politics. Uh, and it's very important, as Simon says, to get ahead of the curve, always kind of be doing stuff in advance rather than waiting opportunistically for things to happen if you can. So thank you everyone for attending. Sorry about the slowness of starting and letting you in and so on and so forth. We have technical issues. Um, and yeah, thank you to our speakers. See you soon. I'm going to close the recording. Uh, Nick and Simon, I will also make your um, packs available.